Jude Law, one of my favorite actors, back at this table. Welcome. Thank you for having me back. Um, how does one decide it's time for me to do Hamlet? Well, I think somewhere in the back of my mind was always a sense that it was inevitable, only because it was a, a challenge that everyone who had played it and those even who hadn't played it, as indeed Richard Harris uh, uh, so eloquently put there, said that, 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 you know, it's the greatest of challenges, but also the most fulfilling of roles. But getting the timing right and the alignment right was always very important to me. And uh, being in the right hands and being in the right frame of mind and at the right time in my own life. And uh, Ken Branner asked me to be a part of this season at the Don Mar in the West End. And um, that involved Michael Grandage, who I think is mm. a fantastic director, and the Donmar, which is a wonderful company, known for gathering terrific ensembles. And it just felt that the time was right, and it was nothing more than that, really. It wasn't a, a, a great urging suddenly. Um, it just felt that the, the, the group of people around me were, were the right group. Why is it the most challenging of roles? Well, now that I'm playing it, I would say it's the most challenging of roles because it requires just about every theatrical element available to you in one performance. Comedy, drama, tragedy, wit, physicality, yeah. passion, romance. Um, it challenges you in uh, dialogue. In, in the size of its soliloquies, seven soliloquies in all to the audience. And then it's also incredibly demanding because I'm stealing a quote here from another great Hamlet, Roger Rees, who said to me, you don't play Hamlet, Hamlet plays you. There is a part of you in him. There is a, it, it has to be your feelings of life because indeed the questions he raises the experience he is going through is in a way a map through life that we all lead and the questions he asks are questions that none of us have answers for and it's mm -hmm. again the reason why the play is so vibrant so alive today as it was 400 years ago but they're questions that we all have to summon in ourselves if you like there's not a caricature like a, a Richard III to hide behind or um, a, a, a fighting king like Henry V he is very much an open spirit and so on a nightly basis, that's very, very demanding to emotionally put yourself through that roller coaster. And that's part of why it is viewed as the favorite Shakespearean role. Because I think the favorite because, because if on, on the whole, I would stick my neck out and say that actors like hard play, you know, like hard work. Right. You know, I, funny enough, I was out for a dinner last night with two of the gentlemen who are in the play. One has a non-speaking role and one who plays Horatio. And... We were talking about the, the, the difference in the experience of playing the role, pl playing the piece here in New York. And, of course, what the, the young guy who, who doesn't speak says is that you know, he's finding it even harder here because, of course, what he doesn't get is the opportunity just to, yeah. to go at it. Um, instead, he's experiencing it from, from a back row watching us. And um, I think actors always feel that out there in front pushing yourself, doing it, is where you want to be. Do you, do you start off with this by saying, I want to go see and learn and reread and reread not only the play but everything else written about the play? Or do you say, in order to be fresh and original, mm. I've got to take a different path? I, um, I had about a year, because I was the last in a, in a season of four, I had about a year before I even started rehearsing, which is a wonderful amount of time. Right. And I wanted to do it properly. You know, I really wanted to know that I'd given it my best and I'd right. embraced it and eaten up absolutely everything available to me. And I started by reading... I felt the best place to start was in the 1600, 1599, around the time when Shakespeare wrote this play, and to find out what was... Uh, uh, to gather as much as I could what was going on in England, in London at that time, what was inspiring this man to write such a revolutionary piece of work. And that took me to uh, several books. One, 1599 by James Shapiro, which looks at the um, uh, at England uh, monarchy, at the church, at the wars in Ireland, what was going on on the streets, and indeed what was being read by those who could read. 
Uh, there was also another wonderful book by Robert McGee called The Elizabethan Hamlet, which looked at the effects that this particular play would have had on an Elizabethan audience. The effect of a ghost on stage, um, for example, would have meant certified damnation for the man talking to him and possible damnation for those in the audience. So little keys that just planted interesting seeds in my mind. And that then led me on to certain texts that they believe Shakespeare could have been reading. The essays of Michel de Montaigne, right, right, right. which, in, if you hold next to the soliloquies, are incredibly similar. And the idea that this was fresh in William Shakespeare's mind, the idea of mining your own feelings um, in, in, a, in, a, in a, almost a linear thought as a way of expressing someone's inner life to an audience was, um, was obviously so sumptuous. And you can see that in the soliloquies. And then, yes, I did, because I had so long, I did go back and see a few of the films that I hadn't seen. I hadn't seen the Mel Gibson film. I went and watched that. You know, the Burton you can get on DVD. The Burton I watched. I had seen that before. Yeah. And I went and watched that and all the wonderful interviews yeah, exactly. uh, around that uh, production with Gilgood, because, of course, he directed right. it. Um, I found a, a recording of Gilgood, which I listened to. I watched the Olivier film. So I did. I, I, I suppose to answer yeah. your question yeah, directly, you I... I I submerged myself. Yeah. But having said that, I, there was a period of time then when I, I actually did another job shortly before I started rehearsals. And looking back, although it wasn't planned, I'm really glad because it meant that I let it all just filter, but at the same time, in a way, removed it from my, the forefront of my mind and was able then to start rehearsing with the text, very much afresh. It stretches you as an actor. It does what to you as an actor? I, Either um, in life or in acting. I think in both. Yeah. I, I, I'm not to overstate the mark. It's, it's, it's absolutely changed <laughs> no. my life. It's Has changed it really? very much so. On a very personal level. On a personal level both as an actor and on a personal level as, as me, as a, as a person. How has it changed you as a person? I think the, 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 the daily demand to summon up a sense of pain, sense of longing, sense of hope, a sense of... Um, belief in the world, in its beauty, and also in its tragedy, in its demise, all, all, that, is, all that is summoned up in this exquisite poetry, yeah. of which is, is, is there only as a map, really, to emotionally allow yourself to follow, has to be imbued with a, with a, with a real heart. And so I've gone through in, in, extraordinary journeys in my dressing room nightly with music and yeah, photographs yeah. and all sorts of things to keep that fresh and alive and it's painful stuff yeah. but it's also stuff that as we all know you know when you experience heightened yeah. emotions they yeah. they make you feel alive and they yeah. reaffirm a sense of yeah. self whether it's a, a love of a parent or a, or a love of a child or whatever it is all which those is, things are very alive in you which is part of the reason that a lot of people have said that that when they read Hamlet they feel like Shakespeare was speaking to them he somehow has gotten something about what it means to be alive. Yeah, absolutely. He, in, through, through a series of questions, he somehow affirms what it is to be alive. It's a very unusual um, equation in a way, because Hamlet questions and questions and questions, but in a, I suppose you could say that those questions are... What keep us all interested? What keep us all interested and what keep us on the edge of our seats in life itself? Mm -hmm. And so to see it mirrored in someone else, to see it coming out of someone else, especially, you know, under such a, 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 a famous mantle as a, a piece of work by William Shakespeare, I suppose is reaffirming. What's the hardest part of it? Everybody is familiar with it. So it has the possibility of being almost clichéish. Yeah, I don't, I, don't, I don't personally find any of that very True. hard. Oh, no, uh, okay, great. I, 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 that whole part of it, you weren't worried about, me, this is the moment I've got to... Sure, I had moments like that in rehearsal. Yeah. There were moments in rehearsal when, early, early on, when, when people were just saying, so Hamlet, and thinking, gosh, I'm Hamlet, this is, this right. is a cliché, you yeah, know. Right. Um, and indeed, the, the, several of the lines in the um, uh, famous soliloquies trip you up early on, but... but Michael has created a wonderful production, and in that production, in that world that exists for three hours, ten minutes every night, right. I am Hamlet in that world. And the journey I follow is very clear to me, 
what I have to do and what better ways to express that journey than through these extraordinary lines, the likes of which we haven't surpassed in 400 years. There is no better way of saying to live or to die, to be or not to be. There is, there is no better way of... Uh, of, of, of <laughs> it stood the test of time. Yeah, it, st it stood the test of time. What I found hard is, is the simple, uh, or rather not so simple, physical application every night. I mean, and, and being mentally alert to be able to change on a line um, with, with, with absolute mm. conviction. It's very, very physically People demanding. who've written about it, not because it's been reviewed here, but it's been reviewed in London. Yes. Uh, talk about the physicality of your own performance, in a sense, how well you move across the stage. Was there thought into that? I mean, is that something that you and the director sort of... No, it wasn't funny just... enough. P people do talk or, or ask a lot about that, and whether exactly. I, I took classes and whether it was something yes, I exactly. in, in decided to... Exactly. To, to, right. to emphasize, to give as, you know, a special yeah, kind it, of it, it's punctuation not. It, it was just a sort of evolution out of the rehearsal process. What I knew, I knew I didn't want him to be a, a brooding, morose, um, introverted stagnant sort of figure. I wanted him to have great life and I wanted these beautiful words and these thoughts and passions, be they dark or light, to have an energy to them. I wanted you to feel his thoughts. And so I think that's what um, started to happen physically. Mm. How do you get to the point where you are Hamlet? I had this discussion with Michael early on and to go back to this this, this idea, which I really don't underestimate, that, that, that Hamlet is not a character of sorts. He is the character within the story, but I have to be him. Right, exactly. I really have tried to play it afresh every night. Now, there is a, there is a very strong blueprint of, of where and what we have to do. I'm not there to frighten other actors or, right. you know, pull rabbits out of hats or anything, but it, it's, it's gotten enough um, elbow room to really allow me to experiment nightly and to allow the emotional thread to follow, to, to lead me. Um, so, to, so I can literally follow my nose emotionally. And that's really allowed me to, I feel, open myself up to him. Um, and I was always a little overwhelmed early on when you stand at the foot of the mountain that is the part and, 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 and put yourself at the end of it. You, if you start to think of where you have to get to at the end of the evening, you, it's overwhelming because it's such a long journey. What you have to do, and it's interesting because this ultimately comes out in the play and in the part, is, is play it by the scene by scene, line by line, and Shakespeare helps you to each moment. Every time a new character comes on, his energy changes. He carries an energy from one and puts it to another in the same way that he'll take lines from characters and use them against them in another scene. And it's almost like a momentum that builds up. And before you know it, you are three hours in and you are at a moment where he himself then says, the readiness is all. Let the be. readiness is all. And to me, what, it was the greatest discovery I had in the part, because so much is made of the, the early part of Hamlet when he's questioning, and he's in this sort of Gordian knot of, of um, self-analysis. And a lot isn't said of this, th that particular speech, which to me is the most beautiful, where he talks of the providence of the fall of a sparrow, if it be now, Tis not to come, if it be not to come, till will be now, if it be not now, yet it will come. The readiness is all. And it's this it's sense of so incredible beautiful, it really is. existential yeah. clarity. And he, 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 he adds it up, he surmises it by saying, let be. And in that moment to me, there's a man who's incredibly open to anything and everything that is thrown at him, including death. Mastering Elizabethan, how do you do it? Um, the, well, there are sort of several sides to it, I suppose. There are always elements and words that make absolutely no sense. Yeah. And you have to be in a company, I believe, or, and I was lucky enough to be in a company where there was no such thing as a stupid question. Everyone was allowed to, have, you know, what does a bodkin okay. mean? Or, that's right. that's, what is a, that's what the, is a fardel? That, that's the rule at this table. <laughs> it has to be so, right? And then, and then, you, then you can begin learning. Exactly. And um, so, first of all, that has to be cleared up. But then you, you, I think it's the same with an audience, you, your ear attunes to it and you have to remember that whilst there is always a specific meaning to a line, there is also a hidden meaning and a poetic meaning. There has to be a moment where you have to allow yourself to play with the words, that the words will 
out of their own shape and sound, create an image. It's not, it's not about being specific, sometimes it is, but on the whole it's about creating a smell, a tone of a feeling.